Serpents from the Garden of Eos Lord Set Goes to Hell Art of Setian Atlantis Adorance Fresco of Thera This is a painting of the serpent goddess and her priestesses inside of a serpentarium in a temple at Thera. The painting is on the lustral basin's north wall. The scene shows a serpent goddess bringing comfort to a worshiper by delivering a magic necklace to her, perhaps making a priestess of her devotee. The magic is the joy of the serpent, the god of Natura, and something in his fields of corn. The soil is painted in the favorite colors of the Scythian Minoans, red ochre and blue, blue being the color of the blue lotus. Was there a religious significance to these colors? Red ochre was definitely a religious themed color since the Setia Minoans used it to paint their holy columns of Kronos, Eros, and Set. Red ochre was the color of blood, nourishment, and death. Red ochre was also a color of birth, growth, regeneration, fertility, and libations for the corn and the bones of the ancestors. The names of Gnosis and Kronos are derived from the Greek word for ochre, orichalcon okros. Blue was most likely the color of the sea and the air, color of life, of the waters of life. Blue may have been another color of birth, growth, fertility, and regeneration. The sea and the water element were the original source of the world's material. Nu, the goddess Night, gave birth to existence from her sea waters of dark night beyond the atmosphere of air. Therefore, blue could have been a color of the night goddess, as well as of her consort, the new horned god of the sea, Poseidon, another version of the earthly and lunar Zagreus. Besides these obviously important reasons for their preference for this color, the air, air, or atmosphere was this color as well, and was the element of both Kronos, Eros, and Rhea, Eos. Rhea was a goddess predominantly of the water element like her mother, the night. But after the war, this goddess may have also stood in as substitute for Nephthys Nekbet, the solar vulture goddess, acting as a goddess of the air element as well. Of course, Eros, Kronos, had always been a god of the air. Kronos, Eros, was in the original Egyptian mythology and language, the Egyptian god of the air, the god Shu. There is also the fact that the Greek words for love and air are nearly the same. Eros is similar to air. Shu, or Kronos, or Eros, was a very good reason for the Setian Minoans 
to prefer this color of the air or air, especially since Gnosis was named after this god of air, fire, cromlech, love, and sex. Gnosis was the city of the god Kronos. Kronos was the ancient Egyptian god Shu, who was the god of the blue sky of atmosphere or air. So, both blue and red ochre were sacred colors of the god Kronos or Eros or Shu, and so they became the colors of his city, Gnosis. Is the left-hand woman a goddess? Yes, her name is Persephone. She is the daughter of Demeter Nix. There is an Uraeus tiara upon her brow, showing that she is a goddess. She also wears serpent bracelets upon her wrists and wears a skith earring. The skith earring shows her to be a harvest goddess, and the serpent bracelets show her to be the serpent goddess of that grain harvest. The plants sprouting up through the soil are the new growth of the grain harvest, and the goddess Persephone was herself thought of as the bread grains of life's sustenance that were reborn from the seeds each year. The myths of the goddess Persephone were understood as a metaphor for the annual growth and regeneration of the corn crop red greens. She was then worshipped as the female sustaining power of Natura. Her brother and mate was Dionysus, the son of Demeter Nix, the son of Night. Dionysus was the male sustaining power of Natura, and the god of wine and the grape harvest. Persephone was originally Lady Isis, and Dionysus was originally Lord Set. Set and Isis were the serpent offspring of Nu, the Egyptian goddess of night. Dionysus and Persephone were the same serpent offspring of the night goddess in the new speak and new mythology of the Setian Minoans, the Gnosians of Atlantis. Were the Setian Minoans monotheists? Mostly. They saw the god of Natura as a being having both male and female characteristics. The ultimate god, or supreme one god, had both a male and female emanation at the creation of the physical universe of Natura. This can be seen from the fact that Natura is composed of both male and female portions, positive and negative, day and night, yin and yang, energy and material, bright matter and dark matter, male and female. Ultimately though, the Supreme God is one being a spirit without the physical form of substance and being in Natura. The gods and goddesses of the mythology and the religion were this one god, 
only appearing or being in Natura with different forms and powers imagined through myth so as to facilitate human understanding and worship. The gods and goddesses were different instances or emanations of the same infinite one God. Infinity is endless and without boundaries. An infinite God is difficult to imagine in a finite, or almost finite, world of Natura around us. Therefore, having multiple gods and goddesses helps our understanding and description and worship of the One Spirit as it moves within this finite Natura. God is One, though God is imagined and described through mythic language as multiple, so as to help the human understanding. Here is the Neolithic Ennead without Neber Chair. Persephone appearing with the new growth of the grain corn fresco. The red and golden subterrane earth sections at the bottom of the painting are meant to represent the cavernous chambers of hell. Some red horns appearing in the golden ochre section directly below the goddess may represent libations made to the serpents and ancestors. The plants shown sprouting in the background are most likely the new growth of the cereal crops of corn. There is also a priestess wearing a blue hat approaching the devotee in the adorant painting center from the other side of the scene. This woman is already a priestess of the goddess since she wears the blue skull cap of the goddess and she is included in the adorant painting to make it clear that the intention of the goddess is to bestow her blessing and favor upon the sorrowful woman in the scene center the woman sitting in the center is most likely sad for the very reason of her exclusion from the serpent priestess society of the goddess. The action of the goddess in bestowing the necklace is then clearly a magical act of blessing and admittance to her serpent society of priestesses. The fact that the painting decorates the wall of a serpentarium of the goddess makes the importance of the scene obvious and the scene has then a clear implication. The sorrowful candidate is receiving the favor of the goddess and becoming a priestess of the goddess. As a serpent priestess she shall be among those of the serpent society of Set, given over to the care intending of the sacred snakes. The necklace is a magical gift then of Persephone's blessing. As an aside, notice that the favorite colors of the Setian Minoans are used in the painting. These colors were the red and golden ochres and the blue of the lotus. The previous painting from the same temple at Thera showed this same newly chosen devotee before she became a priestess. Only this fresco scene shows the woman after her induction as a servant of the goddess. And here she is performing a regular task of a serpent priestess. The goddess Persephone is on the left in this scene as well, observing 
and instructing the newly chosen woman in her religious tasks as a serpent priestess. The newly chosen in this following scene now wears the blue skull cap, blue serpent bracelets, and blue serpent anklets of a serpent priestess. The setting is again in the corn crop fields of the serpent goddess, and one gets the impression that the dress and wear of the new serpent priestess may be fashioned for utility as well as distinction while in the cornfields. The blue hat she wears has a brim in the front to provide shading from the sunlight. The thing that she is carrying to the goddess appears to be an ergo fungus newly picked from the sacred fields of the serpent. The goddess smiles wryly at her new priestess who beams with much surprise and happy devotion. Lotus of Tim and Three Goddesses Fresco Tim was the Egyptian god of the setting sun and the twilight. He was thought of as the first emanation of Neber Cher into this physical existence. Neber Cher was the name of the Supreme One God who exists outside of this universe in the world of forms or spirits. Tim was the god of first emanation into existence at the city of Memphis, the old capital of North Egypt or Lower Egypt. Tim was thought of metaphorically as the blue lotus flower that rose from the water at dawn and disappeared below the waters at nightfall. Once, Tem was the only god of the sun in Memphis. Much later, Tem became one of three solar gods of the sun during the day. When the Heliopolitan theology of Anu became a doctrine throughout Egypt, the gods Kepera and Ra were also made solar gods of the sun's daily path over the sky. Then Tim became simply the god of the twilight instead of the entire day. Before, when Tim was the only solar god in Memphis, he was also the god of the moon. Tim and Zagreus were the names of this lunar and twilight god among the Setian Minoans of Crete. At some point, the Setians of Crete must have added a new name for the god. Zagreus, though, was still the same god of the moon and the sun as Tem once had been in Lower Egypt. The lotus fresco shows blue lotus flowers in a patterned style of painting in which each flower is done exactly the same. The plant with its stem and three flowers is in total thought of as the god Tim or Zagreus. The three flower blooms of six petals and seven stamens each are metaphors for the three goddesses of Setian Minoan myth. Each lotus bloom represents a goddess of night. The three goddesses shown as lotus blooms are Demeter, Nu, Nyx, Rhea, Tefnut, Eos, and Persephone, Isis. This is Demeter, Rhea, and Persephone in Greek myth, and Nu, Tefnut, and Isis in Egyptian myth. 
Nix and Eos are given for clarification in terms of Greek myth. Demeter knew Nix was the goddess of night herself, the mother goddess of all creation that gave birth to the dark abyss of primeval waters from which all creation did arise after being energized by the god Kepara Tem. The blue lotus flower in her pictorial comparison is in the world's material arising from her night sky of dark waters. Rhea Tefna Eos was a goddess of darkness, waters, and feminine sexuality. The popular Latin name for this goddess is Venus. She arises from the water at her birth, and she is the first daughter of Nu, the night sky goddess. She was also a goddess of the morning star the dawn and the departure of night's darkness. Flowing waters and liquids such as libations were a special domain of interest. Persephone Isis was a serpent goddess of the corn crops in the subterran afterlife. The myths of this goddess already linked her with the sprouting of the new crop each year, and rain and liquids produced this new growth from the dry soils each season. So it was an obvious metaphor to link reincarnation of human souls to the blue lotus which arose from the waters with a new day. The blooming of this flower during the day and its descent at night had already been made a part of human spiritual reincarnation myth in Egypt before the Setia Minoans settled in Crete. This information might be known to those Setian Minoans without knowledge of hieroglyphics, but those knowing the sacred language of the pictorial glyphs also understood that the blue lotus bouquet with three flowers sprouting from a clump of soil was a particular glyph with one meaning. This was the unique hieroglyph of Lower Egypt the land of the lotus. The Egyptian hieroglyphic for the kingdom of Lower Egypt, the land of the lotus, was fashioned as a subdued decorative fresco upon this wall of Thera by an artist of Atlantis using the high Setian naturalistic style popular during the nights of the empire. This fresco by itself is almost enough to show that the Setian Sea Empire of Atlantis did exist and Thera was a portion of it. Blue Lotus Hieroglyphic Definition of Hieroglyphic Lower Egypt Land of the Lotus The Blue Monkey Fresco This seems to be another fresco fashioned to be a subdued decorative, though the elusive meaning of it may be more obscure than most of the frescoes discovered so far. Many of the discovered frescoes are naturalistic enlarged renderings of hieroglyphics, and so may this one be, but the exact interpretation doesn't seem to be clear, 
even after one realizes that there were several glyphs that used primates, apes, or monkeys as their main image. The interpretation of this one references at least four glyphs in the Egyptian pictorial language. There are glyphs with the meaning of ape, ape of Thoth, ape wearing the red crown of Lower Egypt, and ape carrying the Uchet eye of the sun. All four of these glyphs have the same pronunciation of Amhet, though they have slightly different meanings with the glyphic apes having to do with different things. One possible guess that might be made is that the Blue Monkeys fresco is a type of counter-propaganda. Our current hieroglyphic knowledge is almost entirely based upon dynastic historical hieroglyphic texts, and these texts were mostly written by scribes from the mainland of Egypt who were responsible to the solar dynasties. The specific glyph to apply with this propaganda theory is the glyph showing an ape wearing the red crown of Lower Egypt. Another glyph that might perhaps apply in this situation is the glyph showing an ape carrying the Ucha eye of the sun. Could be that these glyphs of the red crown and the Ucha eye were later scribal forms of propaganda produced to disparage the lower Egyptians of Setian Atlantis. Perhaps the Setians of Atlantis were known to be either particularly zealous or particularly bad at the arts and learning linked to the god Thoth the scribe messenger god of Kepera Ra Tem. This scribal rivalry between the Setian scribes of Atlantis and those of the solar mainland might have produced some mudslinging propaganda between these rival groups of scribes and artists. Maybe a reasonable guess might be that the painting is mostly counter-propaganda designed to acknowledge the new solarist hieroglyphic propaganda in a positive way by showing the Setian love for the blue monkeys of Atlantis wherever they might happen to cavort. Another thing regarding this fresco were monkeys native to Crete, or did they arrive with the first settlers from Egypt? Most likely, neither humans nor monkeys were present on Crete before the first Egyptian settlers arrived from Lower Egypt at around 9000 BAS. If there were monkeys on the island of Crete, it is most likely because Egyptian settlers brought them with them as pets. As for the hieroglyphic of an ape carrying an Uchet eye of the sun, this might refer to the nocturnal house of Kronos that worshipped the moon primarily as a form of the horned hunter god instead of the sun so much as did the Thebans of Upper Egypt. So, it seems that the Thebans started the bit about the primitives of the Middle Sea being like some greenhorn monkeys of Thoth, and the Setians of Atlantis on Crete didn't really care what the Thebans thought anymore, since they liked their new friends of the sea. If you look at the fresco, 
the blue monkeys are shown while cavorting on the islands in the middle sea, and they seem quite oblivious to any disparaging propaganda used by the scribes of Thebes and Anu to describe the primitive inhabitants of the Setian Island Empire. Of course, the Empire of Atlantis was large and stretched over a long and wide arc of sea involving many islands and coastal areas which had only commercial and frontier links with Egypt throughout much of Neolithic prehistory before the lower Egyptian kingdom had made its later start with more systematic exploration and immigration some while after 7000 BAS. But, hey, this couldn't have been improved upon much earlier than it was. And, it wasn't the lack of knowledge of these hardiest of early settlers who had set out on such perilous voyages into the unknown sea to establish frontier villages in the unexplored cavernous landscape of the islands and coasts? No, they had performed amazingly well in preparing the wild expanses of these vast and dreary Cro-Magnon lands for the later expansion of the Setian Memphites a few millennia later. No, these thirty frontiers peoples were to be thanked and admired for the exemplary fashion in which they had brought the arts of farming and civilization to these remote corners of the world, and had watched these new arts and texts advance into the unmapped hinterland of the Hyperborean Neanderthal mixed natives the Lord set loved their souls. Someone had to bring society to these savages, no matter the cost in blood and sweat or lives lost in sacrifice away from the easy living of civilization with its stone cities and serpent temples. Admiral's Flotilla Fresco and Blue Leopard Fresco. The city that is imaged is either Thera or Gnosis, most likely. The fresco shows the lion forms of Shu and Tefnut hunting deer at the top. The Egyptian gods Shu and Tefnut later became Kronos and Rhea in Setian Minoan mythology. In later Greek mythology, this hunting pair would be Eros and Eos, rather than Kronos and Rhea. And even later than that, in Greek myth, the pair would be Hermes and Aphrodite. Knowing the later forms of Kronos and Rhea, it seems strange that they should be depicted as the lion and lioness hunters that were once the horned hunter and night huntress in the Neolithic. But this is because in Egypt before the first war that exiled the Setians to Crete, the forms of the hunter and huntress had already devolved 
upon their first offspring pair in the Ennead, which was the pair of Shu and Tefna. Then, after arrival in Crete, Shu and Tefna gained the new names of Kronos and Rhea. The other pair of Knight's offspring was set in Isis, and they became the god and goddess of the corn crops in the underworld labyrinth of death and reincarnation. They were not the pair of siblings known in Egypt as Hunter and Huntress. The southern solar bird deities had of course been left behind in Egypt, that is Horus and Nephthys. This left three goddesses worshipped by the Setian Minoans that could be used as subjects for these frescoes of Thera and Gnosis. The Huntress then was primarily Rhea, but there were two griffins painted behind the throne of the queen in her audience chamber at Gnosis. A question then arises as to which deity this other griffin was meant to represent. The griffin was a creature with a lion's body, wings, and a bird's head. Griffins were later supposed to have been the guardians of the ever-flowing wine goblet of Dionysus, and later mythic griffins were also supposed to be linked with Nemesis, the daughter of Nyx, Night. From later myth, then it seems that one of the Cretan goddesses was known by the name of Nemesis, as well as her usual name. The later goddess Nemesis had one temple that is known to have been built, and that was the temple of Nemesis at Ramnusia, northeast of Athens. From the name of this one temple of hers, and the fact that the griffin had a body of a lion, one of the griffin in the queen's throne room must have been the goddess Rhea, the mate of Kronos. Since Ramnusia must be named for the goddess known as Nemesis, Rhea must be the same as Nemesis. This, though, still leaves the problem of the other griffin that was pictured on the other side of the queen's throne. Was it Kronos, or Demeter Nyx, or Persephone? It seems highly unlikely that it might be Dionysus or Zagreus, since neither were known to have a bird form. And though neither Demeter or Persephone had a bird form, one of these goddesses could be thought to have guarded the wine bowl of Dionysus. It doesn't seem likely, though, that it was either of these goddesses, because neither was a deity of the air element. However, Rhea's mate, Kronos, was a deity of the air element. Kronos had always been a god of the air primarily, and even while he was known as Shu in Egypt when the Setians ruled in Memphis and the Delta. Shu hadn't had a bird totem there, but it seems highly likely that he gained a bird totem when he became known as Kronos on Crete. Both he and Rhea must have been given some type of carrion bird for a totem upon moving to Crete 
because the Seti and Minoan burial practice of excarnation required it. Horus and Nephthys had to be replaced as bird deities. Kronos seems to have been given the crow as totem and Rhea the dove, but these could have been any native carrion bird possibly. So Kronos seems to fit the situation of the throne room the best since he was a god similitude for the priest king. And, of course, Kronos had both necessary creature totems in his mythology so as to compose the hybrid griffin, a carrion bird, and a lion. At the far left top corner of the blue leopard fresco, one of these griffin bounds along in pursuit of the ducks or geese at the far right. Below the griffin and over the river is a feminine appearing golden leopard who probably is the goddess Rhea or Nemesis. Further down the stream, Another larger blue leopard is shown approaching the ducks. This blue leopard appears in front of a very tall blue lotus flower which grows from the soil of the river bank. The lotus flower appears mostly in the clear air of the painting's horizon and it sprouts from the surface soil instead of rising from the water. The flower being a blue lotus of such great height, the fact that it sprouts from the soil and not the water, as you should expect, is most likely important. The god Shu, it must be remembered, was the god of the atmosphere between the earth's surface of land and water and the starry sky of night. And Shu was the Memphis version of the god Kronos. Since most of the blue lotus flower rises into the clear air and its base is in the soil and not the water, this makes the plant a flower of Kronos Shu and not of Rhea Eos, as her element was primarily the water originally. The lotus growing behind the blue leopard is a pictorial hint given by the painter that the leopard is Kronos, the other feline hunter of the royal pair of gods who rule in Gnosis. Their sacred hunt of the ducks at right of the painting may be important as a sort of propaganda depiction of the southern Theban royal pair of deities. Kronos and Rhea are then shown in a sacred duck hunt of fowl that proceeds through the lush flora that grows beside some river bank where the stream is of some length and the blue lotus grows high. This is a painting that could have appeared in the Queen's throne room at Knossos as an accompaniment to the decor without a lapse in the mythic theme of her griffin heraldry of the goddess Nemesis. Garden Decoration Fresco This fresco appears to be some type of garden scene because of its obvious similarity to outdoor patio walls adorned with a lattice of lotus and papyrus stems. The lotus and papyrus lattice 
appears to rise from some sort of stone wall in which individual rocks can be seen sketched in blue, red, and golden ochre. The top of the stone wall flows in a smooth, wavy line that forms imaginative hills and valleys. Atop the stone mountains or hills of the wall, the stems of the artificial lotus and papyri rise to form a lattice structure of decorative fencing with blue bands of trimming and cords with lamps and sensors. This delicate and soothingly tasteful subdued garden background must have adorned the interior of some Setian Minoan room of leisure either designed as an atrium or intended for use when the outdoor weather was inclement. The owner of the villa with this garden room was most likely a mysterious functionary of some sort and perhaps a high priestess. The art of the fresco is finished with a great amount of skill and obvious talent that seems almost misplaced when used to create even such a beautiful decorative art for a background wall panel. The painter of this scene must have been one of the very best artist decorators of the high Setian naturalistic style. This development of Setian Minoan art must have lasted for some centuries since most, if not all, of the frescoes that have been discovered so far have shown the same highly developed perfection of the subdued naturalistic and especially as it was then made use of for the ordinary decoration of walls and panels inside the buildings frequently used by the nobility and the wealthy or powerful. This level of art, even when used for such seemingly mundane purposes as the modern equivalent of room decor backgrounds, should most likely be seen as having been made by the best artists of the high Setian naturalistic style, a subdued perfection of method that most likely flourished for some centuries during the social zenith of Imperial Atlantis. Most observers of this art did not notice the subdued intention of the naturalistic form. The artists were attempting to recreate the experience of Natura as seen through the eyes of Cromlechian drama. Their viewpoint was that of Psyche looking upon the evening star brilliance of Eros in his earthly light at the portal entrance. The illusions of Natura were for a purpose, and the artists of Atlantis were attempting to emulate the high fashion of the gods. There was to be an invisibility during the sunshine of day, and the stark gothic black melancholy in the funereal subterrane circle of the moonlit erotic dark night. This subdued naturalism was achieved during the High Setian period at Atlantis, and a wicked example of this can be seen within the garden fresco. The lotus and papyri flower plants of this indoor garden scene are in actuality representations of the totem flowers of Lower and Upper Egypt. The blue lotus on the left 
above the pictorial garden stone wall is the national flower of Lower Egypt. In the white papyrus on the right is the national flower of Upper Egypt. The stone wall of the pictorial garden is not a wall in actuality as the stone wall is fashioned in the exact same shape as an Egyptian hieroglyphic that had specific definitions important to the use of the flowers. This hieroglyphic that is here expanded or resumed much larger than a regular glyph is a picture character that has the meaning of mountainous country or foreign country. The subdued naturalism of the painting style of artistry that obscures this somewhat obvious interpretation of the fresco. A knowledge of Egyptian hieroglyphics or a dictionary of the pictorial language is necessary to understand the real importance of the seemingly mundane wall fresco fashioned during the high Setian naturalistic at Thera. Setian Nasian Crete is then the mountainous country of the Blue Lotus on the left of the fresco, and the southern Theban mainland of Upper Egypt is the white papyri growing from the glyph for foreign country on the fresco's other side. 2. Mountain Wickedness Set Mountainous or Foreign Land Here it may help to understand that a single lotus flower was a hieroglyphic for the lotus plant and a single papyrus was a glyph for the papyrus plant. Bunches of three lotus growing together from a single clump of earth was a somewhat different glyph with the meaning of Lower Egypt, Land of the Lotus. Bunches of three papyri growing together from a single clump of earth was a somewhat different glyph with the meaning of Upper Egypt, Land of the Papyrus. It is very likely that the best painters of Atlantis were also scribes with a knowledge of Egyptian hieroglyphics. Else, the patrons of these artists must have had scribbled knowledge of the Egyptian hieroglyphics. More than likely, the artists and their patrons had this scribbled knowledge of Egyptian hieroglyphics. One other point to observe in this fresco is the artist's use of colors. The glyph on the left is obviously the Setian Atlantis of Gnosis with its blue lotus flower glyph emblem. And the colors of the country or nation glyph forming the garden wall are red ochre and blue. The blue and white trim of the Setian lattice and nation glyph also has the black emblems of the serpent gods Set and Isis arranged in linked spirals over their length. The other side of the fresco has the glyphs for the foreign land of Upper Egypt. The colors of the foreign country or land glyph are a golden ochre and white and the trim only has serpentine spirals in the topmost bands of the lattice, whereas 
The bottom bands of trim have only a sky blue color. This single fresco by itself is almost enough to show that the Setian Sea Empire of Atlantis did exist on Crete. Venus rising from the sea with lotus and pearls. This fresco is a painting of one of the best known myths from Greek religion, the rise of Aphrodite from the sea at her birth. The bloody phallus and testicles of Uranus have been cut off the body of her father by Kronos. The bloody members are then thrown into the sea by the Saturnine god where they later alchemize and bubble up from the sea foam into the new goddess of love and beauty. This is obviously a very old myth from the earliest levels of Greek religion since it is a myth of the fall of Uranus and the rise of Kronos as the chief deity of the gods. Perhaps the reason this tale has been preserved so well down through the centuries is because it also is a myth of the Setian migration from Egypt to Crete. It's a myth of how Uranus, or Anu, was replaced by Kronos, the god of Gnosis, when the Setians left their former motherland of Lower Egypt and went into exile upon Crete after the first war between the moon and the sun. When the Setians left Lower Egypt and made a new sea kingdom on Crete, they wished to leave the old gods of the sun behind them and worship only the nocturnal gods that had been most popular in their former land of the Lotus. Previous to the war in the Setian exile, there had been some overlapping of the lunar and solar cults of worship in Egypt. And within mainland Egypt, after the war, there was still some of this residual overlapping of the mythology and worship, mainly because of the stubborn persistence of the northern populace and carrying on the traditional worship of the old gods of night. The city of exiles on Crete, however, had not this difficulty to overcome in their new motherland of night because their own colonists from lower Egypt had first settled the island thousands of years before the war. Crete was already an established and thriving colony of the Lower Kingdom for many centuries before the refugee dynasts of night arrived from the land of the Lotus. Upon their arrival at Gnosis after the war was lost, the Setian dynasty established a new Ennead of the gods that excluded the old solar gods entirely, for they no longer needed to include the gods of the enemy within their pantheon of deities. The new Ennead of Gnosis was exclusively a nocturnal pantheon of gods and goddesses very similar to the old one at Memphis, but without any of the solar gods included. Three deities were then left behind in Egypt, and these were the supreme solar god Kephara Ra, Horus, the hawk god of the sun, and Nephthys, the vulture goddess of the sun. Six gods of the old Memphite Ennead remained mostly unchanged and became the gods 
of a new pantheon at Knossos. Within the Greek and Cretan myth of Aphrodite, the old father god Uranos is the solar god of Anu, Heliopolis, who is left behind in Egypt. Uranos was the Setian Cretan name for the solar god Kepara Ra of the city of the sun, a city named Anu. This is why he is killed and undergoes castration by Kronos in the new myth of Aphrodite rising from the sea. This myth is a sort of mythic farewell to the old solar gods of Anu and Thebes and the kingdom of Upper Egypt. Kronos and his sister Aphrodite were in the old Ennead at Memphis, the Egyptian god Shu and his sister, the goddess Tefnut. They gained new Setian names some while after the war and the exile to Crete. Kronos became in effect the new chief god of Knossos and his sister got the new name of Rhea and ruled with him. The name Aphrodite was at this point in Setian myth an adjective describing the goddess Rhea as being born from the foam of the sea. Aphrodite means born of the foam in Greek. Later this adjective was used so much to describe the goddess that it eventually became another name for Rhea. This then is where the lotus flowers of the fresco painting come into the myth of Rhea. When the solar gods of Anu were left behind, there remained one solar god of Anu that was retained by the Sedians. This god was named Tem. Tem was the god of the sunset, the twilight, and the onset of night. The Solaris of Anu used Tem as one of their three solar gods who personified the sun during the day. Kepara was the sun at dawn. Ra was the sun at noon. And Tem was the sun at twilight. Tem was also the supreme god of Lower Egypt, and the god Tem had the blue lotus as a sacred flower. This flower, the blue lotus, was also the emblem of Lower Egypt and its Setian dynasty of night. Tem, though, wasn't merely a god of the sun at twilight, he was also the god of the moon. The eyes of Tem were both the sun and the moon. Tem must have been a very ancient god of the lower Egyptians, another name for the god Anu, when these gods were the horned hunter of the sun and the moon. Anu and Tem were the different names of the supreme god as the horned hunter of Natura. Anu was once the horned hunter during the day and Tem was once the horned hunter during the night. At the start of the Neolithic, some 12,000 years ago, they were once names for the eyes of the supreme god in the sky. The sun was thought of as his eye during the day, and the moon was thought of as his eye at night. Anu, the sun, and Tem the moon then became interchangeable names for the spring god of Natura. Tem was really then a god of the night who was the horned hunter god of the moon, an extremely ancient name for the spring god of Natura. 
Tem is such an ancient god, they may once have been worshipped in the caverns of the Paleolithic, when the world's first artists sketched charcoal and ochre paintings by torchlight for him. The first offspring of Tem and the night goddess were Shu and Tefnut. Shu was thought of mainly as the god of the air, but it was also the light, fire, twilight, a cromlech, and phallic male sexuality. Tefnut, his sister, was thought of mainly as water and rain. She was also the dark, dawn, a circle, and female sexuality. Somewhat later in Setian Atlantis, Shu was named Kronos, and Tefnut was named Rhea. The Lotus was the emblem of Lower Egypt in the Scythian dynasty of night. The blue lotus was the species most particularly thought of as its emblem. Blue and red ochre were the emblematic colors of the Scythian dynasty. The blue lotus was emblematic mainly because it was seen as a flowering metaphor for human life and reincarnation, the process of Natura's cyclical regeneration. Not only was this lotus a model of reincarnation, the flower also unified the mythos of the gods with the psychical process of regeneration visible within Natura. The twilight of Tim and his rise as the moon into the night sky was metaphorically linked with the descent of the blue lotus back beneath the waters of the delta. The god Shu was the blue lotus lowering the descent of night upon Seb, the earth god. When Shu descended into the waters like the lotus, this was seen as night's descent through the atmosphere of Shu's air element to unite with the Earth's surface. Shu, the air, then disappeared into the dark waters of the goddess Nu, and Seb and Nu embraced. Tefnut, the sister of Shu, was the dark waters of her mother Night, or Nu, into which the lotus submerged in the dark. Tefnut was also the dawn and the morning star, and this was when the lotus re-emerged from the dark waters into the day. With the emblem of the blue lotus, the Setian Egyptians of Memphis made a metaphoric model of human existence and reincarnation, a model of Natura's cosmos and a mythic model of the nightly interaction of the gods. The fresco of the Blue Lotus at Thera shows groups or bunches of four lotus flowers emerging from the waters of night, where Demeter knew, where they sprout from clamshells. The lotus flowers are then specific metaphors for the goddess Rhea as she emerges from the sea, as the flowers of blue lotus emerge at dawn into the air of day. The artist is giving a top-down aerial view of the sea where the flowers are emerging from the clams below the surface of the sea. It is near dawn, the light of Lucifer, the light bringer, is bright in the darkness. Rhea is rising through the blue depths of Nu. 
The Serpentine Octopus Fresco This is a favorite fresco of those discovered so far, except those featuring the goddess Persephone. As a purely decorative painting, or seemingly decorative painting, this fresco most likely cannot be surpassed. This is subdued decorative naturalism of the high Setian style at its finest. This painting is probably best imagined to adorn the wall of some temple, anteroom, or public area. At first glance, an observer most likely might admire it a few moments as a naturalistic deep sea scene with an amazing sketch of an octopus then proceed on their way. The fresco is very subdued and a masterpiece of world art. The octopus is not any octopus but the octopus ruler of the deep. This is the sea god ruler of Atlantis. This is Lord Poseidon. A fresco very much like this one almost certainly adorned a wall in the temple of Poseidon mentioned by Plato. This is the painting equivalent of the Lord Poseidon pulled from the Aegean Sea, only this may be one of the earliest images of the great Lord of the Sea ever made. Even though it is most likely a Theron reproduction of a greater masterpiece at Gnosis, it still fascinates with an awe engendered by the sheer surprising alien quality of it. And not only that, it is fashioned in the best artistic style of the Setian Palace and Temple Illustrators. Nothing at first glance seems to indicate the great presence it so subtly sketches for the viewer. At first, you admire the technique of the artist, saying, damn, that's a great use of a few colors in making a quick sketch for someone's palatial wall. Or do you need the painting, boss? Then after a long while, looking it over, the octopus creeps stealthily up on you with its long serpentine tentacles extended in the love embrace. After it clutches you and you are getting somewhat without breath, you start noticing things. There are only three tentacles to this octopus. Each of the tentacles has a similar serpentine shape. The inside of the tentacles all look the same, with similar oblong cups attached. The head and body of this octopus is only half visible, and it looks like a rather pale half moon that is casting a sort of long and pale snaky shadow underneath the tentacles sort of sliding over the sea floor. Is that a snake underneath the sea? Those three tentacles, they're weird. They have curls at the top that form the same outline. You look into the interior space formed by the curling tentacles. Those look like crescent moons, you say. A half moon that is really a full moon octopus body that is cropped and three tentacles with crescent moon curls at the top make for the deities of night beneath the sea and of course there is a serpent slithering beneath all this looking like some pale shadow in this strange ochre scene of the deep that shows bands of light wavering through the depths This is great. This isn't some deco sketch of the deep for room color. This is a very subtle religious scene 
of Scythian mythology. With this realization, you get it finally, and you're charmed. This was a fresco produced when? This was a painting on a wall at Thera before the volcano eruption. Why, that's 3,700 BAS at least. The painting could be nearly 4,000 years old. Looks like it was done yesterday. Doesn't look Egyptian. Egyptian art is more formal than that. Yes, but this more naturalistic style of Atlantis has a certain form also, though it's a weird, sort of different form. For instance, the tentacles all have a particular serpentine curvature, and there are three of them, not eight. Rendezvous with Rama. It's Egyptian alien stuff. The three tentacles are goddesses of Gnosis, only they have taken an underwater swim. That highest tentacle there, that big one in the middle, with the long cups, that must be the goddess Night. That wasn't difficult, but who are the others? Which one is which? Must be some hint somewhere. Let's see here. Must be something. This is underwater, of course, and there isn't much to go on. Meanwhile, you can see and feel the bubbles rising upwards. That has to be it. Must be the effect of light and the colors. Looking closely, you notice that the crescent moon of night has the red ochre horizon circled inside a tentacle tip. That's it. The red ochre extends all the way from one side to the other and is obviously intended to represent the horizon underwater. Above water, that might be the night sky. So that is definitely the goddess Demeter Nu. The leftmost goddess, following the same guide, must be Persephone. Her tentacle has a seaweed encircled in its tentacle moon. Corn was originally a wild weed on the surface above ground before Persephone learned to plant seeds and grow weeds. The seaweed even looks sort of like a tall weed of corn. The last tentacle is the widest and closest at fresco bottom. This, of course, has to be the goddess Rhea. And sure enough, it is, since the sea floor, her tentacle tip has circled is the lightest shade of ochre used in the painting. Here it must be remembered that Rhea was a form of Eos, the morning star of dawn, the light bringer, and Rhea was an early form of Venus as well, a goddess of the same star who had human love and sexuality as her domain. And Venus was born of a clamshell. Venus was known as the Pearl of the Sea, the pale goddess of the sea likened unto a pearl. The light streaming over the seafloor is a pale ochre color between the red ochre of the horizon and the shadows of the orange ochre at the painting bottom. The last clue that it is Rhea is the cropped form of the octopus that could be seen as a pearl of extraordinary size and luster, with the 
octopus tentacles merely extending from behind it, where somewhere the form of Poseidon lurks while guarding the pearl. The half moon shape at left can then be thought of as either Poseidon, an octopus, a full moon cropped, or a huge pearl. The three goddesses of Gnosis are the three serpentine tentacles, and the pale shadow at the very bottom may be Lord Dionysus Set, who slithers in from the labyrinth to give us a hint towards realizing the presence of the goddesses in this deep sea scene.